All right. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so we're just going to start off with these two warm-up questions. They're just going to kind of review those chair conformers that we were talking about last week. And then we're going to go into all of chapter four in the student workbook, hopefully. Um, we want to basically start with chiral centers, you know, we're going to talk about RNS configuration, we're going to go into, you know, determining if my overall molecules are chiral, achiral, meso, and we'll probably kind of tail off this office hour session with delineating between enantiomers enantiomer and diastereomers, and I'm trying to get to Fisher projections today, so we will do my best to get us there. You guys do have your test on Friday this week. So if you get through chapter four within the student workbook, I think that's the end of the exam material. And really on Wednesday, what I want to do is just do the critical thinking for chapters three and four. It starts on page 48 and goes to page 53, it looks like. And those are really important questions to know, you know for your upcoming exam because it applies all of chapter three and chapter four together. Anyway, let's kind of jump right in. So for this first question, it says, fill in the empty chair conformer and decide which conformer is the most stable. Well, we know that either one or four is what's being pulled up and out of plane. So in this situation, I'm gonna choose a different color. We know that, let's call this one carbon number one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and carbon six. And let's also number our template over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so on carbon one, remember it was pulled down here like below the plane of two, three, five, and six. So that means that this equatorial nitrile group should be oriented upwards up here. Okay, and then that means that that hydrogen, which was axial over here, is now equatorial over here. Okay, nothing on two, so let's go to three. So if it was axial methyl down, so it should definitely be equatorial methyl. So let's do something like this. Um, equatorial methyl, CH3, and axial hydrogen. Let's draw that right there. And then on carbon four, we had axial alkyne, so it should be equatorial alkyne. So let me draw that over here. And that would mean axial down proton hydrogen. Okay, so this is our filled in chair conformer. So that's half the battle. So remember, anything that was equatorial goes axial, and anything axial goes equatorial. Okay, so that's another way to verify. Then we want to decide which conformer is the most stable. So let's use our relevant delta G values to kind of figure that out. So let's start with, you know, the chair conformer to the left that I just filled in. And I see that my nitrile group is oriented axial up here with these eclipsing hydrogens, you know, one, two, three, and then one, two, three. So also I'll just draw in on carbon five, there is an axial up hydrogen. So if you want to see these interaction, I'm going to draw these kind of like cartoon depictions over here. So all of these things are going to interact. Those are the one, three diaxial interactions here. So then that would be the nitrile diaxial interaction. So that's 0 0.21 kilocals per mole. 0 0.21 kilocals per mole. Okay, and remember that our alkyne and our methyl group are both oriented axial. So, you know, we don't have to deal with any of these one, three diaxial interactions. I'm sorry, equatorial, I should say. Okay, so that would be the relevant delta G value for this first chair control. And then in the second one, we see that, okay, this nitrile is equatorial, but we have two axial substituents. So, you know, in actuality, this alkyne is, you know, interacting with you know, these groups up top here, and these eclipse interactions are bad, as well as these methyl groups are interacting with these hydrogens below the plane. Okay, so there's going to be two types of diaxial interactions here. So on the top position, that alkyne is going to cause 0 0.46 kilocals per mole. Okay, and then on the bottom, that methyl group is gonna cost 1.70. So I don't even need to do any math, but I can definitely see that this chair conformal on the right is going to be 1.7 to 0.46. That's definitely a lot higher than this, than this value, 0.21. So that means that this structure to my left must be the most stable chair conformer. So that is the most stable chair conformer. Okay, does anybody have any questions on that? All right, let's move on. So for number two, given the structure below and the relevant delta G values, decide if the indicated group would be, oh, we got a question, uh, hold on one sec. Um, on the left, would there be 0 0.46 as well with the three hydrogens going down? 
three hydrogens going down. Are you talking about, Skylar, are you talking about this hydrogen on four, the hydrogen on two, and the hydrogen on six? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so that actually isn't counting because notice in this situation right here where I put this chart, we didn't indicate any HH eclipsing interaction, so you can assume that they're negligible. If they're not indicated in this chart, don't worry about them. Okay. And then for the second question, we're going to see which orientation is this indicated group, this tert butyl group, when it's in the most stable chair conformer. So this is a little bit more tricky, so we need to draw both chair conformers. So remember, we need to first do our structure. So we'll draw this one, and we'll draw this pen is a bad pen, okay? And we'll draw this one. Okay, so we have these two chair conformers. So essentially, let me just call this fluorine number one, just arbitrarily, no reason. Okay, and let me label my carbons in here. Okay, so carbon one, remember, how we draw these chair conformers is we pulled carbon one up and out of the plane. So if the stereochemistry is a wedge, which typically likes to be up, then let's leave it as axial. Okay, so one, that fluorine is definitely on a wedge, which likes to be up. And the trend predicts on carbon number one that I should be oriented up. So I like that fluorine being axial, which makes that dashed hydrogen, which we can't really see, equatorial. Okay, and then two, the trend would be up, down. So does the stereochemistry want to be down on two? Well, yeah, dashes like to be down. So let's make that group also axial and we'll make that proton equatorial. Okay, and then on carbon three, there's nothing. So four, the trend goes up, down, up, down. So does the stereochemistry on four want to be down? No, it's a wedge. So let's make that terpetal group equatorial and we'll make that hydrogen that's on a dash there axial. Okay, so that is my first chair conformer. And then I'm just gonna switch all the groups on my second chair conformer. So hopefully you guys are fast at this at this point. So this would be something that's like that. And this, and three would be nothing. And then four, we would have axial up, terpetal group, and equatorial hydrogen, okay? So that's just quick, you know, axial to equatorial, equatorial to axial. So hopefully you guys are fast at that. And then now let's just calculate the delta G values of both sides. So, you know, let's just start with this first structure that we drew. So the floral group being 0 0.24 up here, is axial, the bromo group being 0 0.57 here, and actually no terpetal interactions because it's equatorial. So we would add 0 0.57 plus 0 0.24 to get 0 0.76 on the right side. Then on the left side, the fluorine and the bromine are oriented equatorial, so we don't have to talk about delta G, but the terpetal group is gonna cost five kilocals per mole. Okay, so that's the one on the left. So clearly, and the most stable chair conformer, which is not the five kilocal one, it's the 0 0.76 one on the right, that terpetal group was oriented equatorial. Okay, so we would say it wants to be equatorial. Now, you could have done this in two seconds without doing any of this work by seeing that, okay, in my head, I see fluorine up, bromine down, and then on four, that terpetal group's equatorial. So I see this in my head without drawing it out. And basically, I know that fluorine and bromine are axial, so those are gonna be these really tiny numbers and they are nowhere near what five is gonna be. So that terpetal group definitely cannot be axial. So you can kind of use some like um, quantitative approaches, I guess you could say, because if the other two substituents are so, so, so tiny, 0.2 and 0.5 compared to that big five value, you know that no matter what, given that those fluorine and bromines are oriented equatorial, this terpetal group being axial is gonna be the deciding factor for stability. Anyway, okay, so that's kind of a good review of chair conformers. Does anybody have any questions on those? I know they're really visual, not fun, but I think I did a decent job at trying to convey that information to you. Give you guys a second. All right, so let's kind of move on. We're going to do chirality. So that's, we're going to pick up on page 40. Okay, so this I'm going to just talk about really briefly because I think this is like one of the most simplest things in the class. So Basically, what you want to do in these situations so far is circle all the chiral centers in the molecules depicted. And I went ahead and did that for you guys already. So basically, what is a chiral center? So a chiral center is any sp3 center. So I'm going to write this out here. So chiral center, okay, has to be an sp3 carbon, okay, sp3. So what does sp3 imply? Well, that means four substituents, okay, four substituents. But there is one more constraint. 
out of those four substituents, they all have to be different. So different substituents, okay? So what does that mean? Well, if I have a carbon with four substituents and every single one of that four substituents is different, it's a chiral center, okay? So chiral center just means that it's a entity, a um, carbon, a, a piece of the molecule that when light is shown onto it has the ability to rotate. So if I were to shine light, you know, maybe at this chiral center, maybe as it comes in this way, maybe incident this way, it rotates maybe coming out that way. You know, it basically rotates polarized light, okay? And we're gonna talk about those specific details in a few minutes, okay? So you basically wanna go through your molecule, whatever molecule you're given, and look for any center, any carbon, okay? Carbon specifically, that has four different substituents. So let's look over here, four different substituents, okay? And that's a chiral center right there. And over here, we see we have this substituent to the right, this substituent below, this substituent to the left, and then the imaginary hydrogen neutron. Okay, so you're just literally looking for centers that have four different substituents. Now, a dead giveaway is if I see any wedges or dashes oriented in form of carbon, immediately circle that, okay? So this wedge, this wedge, this dash, this dash, all big, quick indicators that we're gonna have a chiral center. Sometimes chiral centers are not gonna be depicted as the wedge dash format on your test on purpose. So for instance, look at, um, let's see. Um, actually, I can go back. So remember these questions over here? So these are chiral carbons. This one here, this position, this one at this position, but the stereochemistry was left out because you know maybe if we were to ask you this question and say circle the chiral centers, we would want you to know that there were four substituents that are here. So hydrogen, hydrogen. Okay, so they may or may not be drawn in that wedge dash format, but if they are drawn in wedge dash format, dead giveaways to circle that. Okay, does anybody have any questions on A through D on any of these chiral centers? I think it's really easy. You're just circling these carbons that are four different substituents, okay, and that's all we're doing so far. Okay, I think we're all good there. Okay, so now we want to determine if molecules are chiral, achiral, and or meso, and that is kind of where we want to slow down and pay more attention to detail. Okay, so I'm still on page 40 if you guys are following along, but I'm going to draw these out on separate paper. So we want to determine if the molecule as a whole is chiral. So just because a molecule has a chiral center doesn't mean that it's going to be a chiral molecule, okay? So just like molecules could have polar bonds in them doesn't mean that the molecule overall is polar. And a perfect example of that would have been, you know, earlier in the semester when we saw, you know, dipole moments and we were doing something like this, okay? So yeah, all of these carbon fluorine bonds are definitely going to be polar bonds, oops, sorry. All of these carbon fluorine bonds are polar, okay? So we know that the electron density is going to be towards all of these fluorines, you know, we keep going and keep going, okay? But what happens is, is that since these dipole moments all cancel out, we're gonna have a net zero dipole moment. Dipole moment. So the same kind of concept applies to the chirality. Just because you have one chiral center, if there's symmetry, like there's symmetry with these dipole moments, and if there's symmetry with these chiral centers, then we're gonna cancel out the overall chirality of the molecule. Again, I'm gonna show you guys a couple of examples. All right, so we're gonna pick up on 2A. 2A over here. So 2A, the structure looks like this, okay? And the first thing you wanna do is circle any chiral centers. Okay, so I'm gonna draw in some hydrogens here. Okay, so it is very common for students to circle these carbons right here and say that they are sp3 centers. They are sp3 centers 100%, but those substituents aren't four different substituents. Notice that you have a methyl here and a methyl here, as well as a methyl here and a methyl here. So these carbons are not going to be chiral centers. And you would also be inclined to pick this center right here, but this isn't a chiral center either because the left substituent and the right substituent, which are these isopropyl groups, are the same as well. So there are no chiral centers in this molecule, actually. So no, I'm gonna abbreviate chiral center as CC. No chiral centers, therefore a chiral. Okay, so that brings us to our first rule, and I'm gonna write these out for you. So rule number one. Okay, if zero chiral centers, then I'm just gonna say then a chiral. And this is always. Okay, rule number one. If zero chiral centers, then the molecule overall is going to be a chiral. And that's easy. If there's no sort of chiral centers in there, why would that molecule be chiral? Okay, so a chiral. All right, let's look at B. Okay, I hope that makes sense so far. So for 2B, we have another structure. So something that looks like this. 
Okay. So yeah. All right. Um, it looks like I definitely have a chiral center here. So I'm going to circle that one because you can imagine that hydrogen on a wedge. You can imagine the chlorine on a dash, this ethyl group to the left, and this whole right side of the molecule with a ketone to the right. Okay. So that's definitely a chiral center. And likewise, there's also a chiral center over here. Okay. I'm just drawing the hydrogens to help you guys out. So I see two chiral centers here. So definitely not rule number one. Okay. Well, if these two chiral centers are symmetrical, okay, this side is going to rotate light some direction, let's say to the left or something like that. And then this side is going to rotate towards the right some direction. Okay. So that overall chirality, since it's symmetrical and the same substituents is going to be called um, miso. Okay. So miso is a specific name that you give to molecules that have chiral centers, but are overall a chiral because of symmetry. Okay, I know that was a lot of things, so I'll say it again. So rule number two, okay? If chiral centers are present with sigma plane of symmetry, we're gonna say equals a chiral slash miso, okay? I definitely want you guys to say miso as well as a chiral. Okay, so make sure you say both of those names. All right, so what does that mean? So what is a sigma plane? So this could be done a lot quicker. So as soon as I saw the symmetry, this is my sigma plane. Sigma, S, for symmetry, okay? That's why we say sigma, sigma, S, symmetry. Okay, and that sigma plane is what's a dead giveaway that whatever chiral properties that this carbon has, maybe let's say rotating to the left, is gonna be completely balanced out by whatever chiral properties are going on over here towards the right. Okay, so that's why that these chiral centers are definitely present, but there is no sort of chirality with this whole molecule due to the symmetry. That's this name, miso, and by proxy, since it doesn't rotate light, we can call it a chiral as well. Okay, so that's rule number two. And I think I got a question here. Let's see. Can there be a case where a molecule has no chiral centers but has no sigma plane of symmetry? No. If you have no chiral centers, you cannot be chiral. Okay. All right, so 2C. So actually, I guess it's 2G is how we label it. Okay, so 2G looks like this. And then we have this down here. So the first thing we wanna do is see, sorry, one second, guys. The first thing we wanna see is where are our chiral centers? So I see wedges and dashes, kind of dead giveaways that these are gonna be our chiral centers. I'm just drawing those hydrogens to make it a little bit more clear. Okay, so we see we have an ethyl group, this left side of the molecule, this sulfhydryl group, and this hydrogen. Same thing on the left side as well. Okay, so we see we have two chiral centers. Um, do we see a sigma plane? Okay, well, we definitely don't see a sigma plane right now, but there's something I want you guys to do. So this is actually a trick question. Let's rotate around this bond. Okay, maybe let's do that 180 degrees. We're gonna do this 180 degree rotation. Let me number this, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're rotating bond three, four, okay? Let's call that bond three, four. We're rotating that 180 degrees. So one, two, three, oops, I'm sorry. Let me read that again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, let me renumber that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so that three group, okay, is still oriented down like it was in the middle, in that original molecule. So let's keep that sulfhydryl group down on that dash. But what happened was, is we rotated this bond down, this bond down. Do you see how my pen's going? This bond down. So if that was a wedge before, it should definitely be a dash now, okay? So it wasn't clear at first that there was a sigma plane, but upon rotation, there 100% is this sigma plane. Okay, so this is another example of rule number two. So we're gonna call this a chiral and miso. Okay, anybody have any questions on 2G? I know that was a little bit more intuitive. So sometimes it was obvious based on the symmetry provided. Sometimes you have to rotate just to make sure you see the symmetry. Rotation kind of like bothers people because it's a 3D type of movement. So what you really wanna to do to help yourself out is number this carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then, and then basically whatever bond you're rotating, this three to four bond right here, is gonna be a cis orientation. So you're going from trans to cis. That's why I drew it like that. Okay, maybe that helps you guys. All right, so let's do 2H. Um, so I'm going to move over here. I know I'm kind of all over the place, but 2H. So 2H kind of looks like the one we did before. Okay, so let's see what's going to happen here. 
Okay. So yeah, we definitely have two chiral centers. Let me circle this one and circle that one. We see we have a propyl group to the right, that's all hydro group, the imaginary hydrogen, the left side, you know, on this side we have an ethyl group and things like that. Okay, so the difference from 2G and 2H was we had the same four substituents on carbon three as we did on carbon four, okay? Remember, ethyl group, ethyl group. But the difference over here for 2H is this right chiral center has a propyl group, not the ethyl group that this one has. So the symmetry you can already tell from 2G isn't gonna be apparent here. So we know that we don't really have to rotate. There isn't gonna be any sort of symmetrical, you know, plane because we have a propyl group here and an ethyl group there. So we see that we have two chiral centers, okay? So this is really rule number three, okay? And if there are chiral centers with no sigma plane, always chiral. And that kind of makes sense. There's no sigma plane. So yeah, this is gonna rotate one way. This is gonna rotate one way. They're not gonna be the same degree. So we can you know, basically add up those effects like we did with these dipole moments. We can add up the magnitude of that direction and then get an overall rotation caused by that molecule. So yeah, we're gonna call that chiral, okay? So I think those were all the cases that we saw. Um, oh, we got a question here. If a molecule has sigma plane of symmetry, does that automatically make the molecule chiral? A chiral. Uh, yes, waiting for that. Um, yeah, you can kind of go ahead with that logic. Yeah, that's good. If you see symmetry and there's a chiral center present or even a lack of chiral centers, then it would be a chiral. Yeah. Okay. So I think that was a good kind of summary with those. Maybe we can do a couple more examples. So um, let's look at 2C. I think we're on right now. 2C. And 2C looks like this. Okay, so let's circle our chiral centers. So I only see one carbon with four different substituents, sp3, and it's this one. So if there's one chiral center and no plane of symmetry, that's rule number three, like we just described above, chiral. No thinking. Okay, 2D. 2D looks like this. Okay, so I see I have two chiral centers. I see I have this hydroxyl, this amino group. Okay, there's definitely no symmetry going on here. So two chiral centers, no plane of symmetry, chiral as well. Okay, see these are really easy, quick problems. Okay, so I don't, and it should be easy. You guys um, should definitely get your free points here. All right, let's just do 2E real quick. Okay, so all right, it looks like we have almost symmetrical orientations on the left and right side with respect to this ketone, but notice that the wedge and dash orientation is not the same. So there is not a plane of symmetry, okay? The plane of symmetry only applies when the stereochemistry of these, of these substituents are going to be the same orientation. So essentially, this is a chiral center, that's a chiral center, okay? No plane of symmetry, that's rule number three again, so chiral, okay? I hope you guys are getting this, it's pretty quick. All right, 2F, 2F. Okay, so it's looking like this. I'm gonna move the paper up, okay? So it looks like I have a chiral center here. Oh wait, I don't have a chiral center here. The reason why I don't have a chiral center here, even though we're tricking you with this wedge dash like orientation, is we have a propyl group to the left, one, two, three, and a propyl group to the right, one, two, three. So this isn't a carbon with four different substituents. Yes, it's sp3, but it's not four different substituents, okay? So if rule number one said, if we have no chiral centers, then it's always gonna be a chiral, a chiral. Okay, that one's easy. And I wanna do one more example. Okay, so let's do 2K. I got a question. We, why could you not rotate the bond in 2E? Is it because of the double bonded O? Yes. So remember, double bonded or triple bonded things are rigid. They can't be rotated because remember that P bond or the P orbital overlap is kind of fixed in that one orientation. And if we were to rotate, you know, around that bond, we don't have that P bond, that P orbital overlap anymore, okay? So we're not able to rotate pi bonds or um, triple bonds for that matter, okay? Um, that was a good question. And I think we have another question. Can you have an achiral molecule with no planes of symmetry? Um, yeah, so if you have a molecule with no chiral centers, then that would be an example as well, something that's achiral. So that works, Maria. All right, 
So 2K, let's just finish that one and we can start doing RNS. So 2K looks like this. Hopefully this is a dead giveaway. Okay, so let's circle our chiral centers. So we have one, two, three, four. Okay, but obviously I see a sigma plane here. So this molecule is gonna be rule number two where we have chiral centers present but there's a plane of symmetry, so the molecule as a whole is going to be achiral and gets that special name as well, MISO. Okay. And I think that's good practice. Any, any questions on determining chiral centers? These are my three rules. Maybe you guys want to take a screenshot on your computer so you can have all these things like written out nicely. Um, rule number one, if there are no chiral centers, always achiral. Rule number two, if there's a chiral center present but a sigma plane, it's achiral and MISO. And rule number three, if there's a chiral center with no sigma planes, then it's always chiral. Really easy. All right, let's move on to absolute configuration. All right, so honestly, RNS configuration was designed by these IUPAC chemists, and they just came up with the system on their own. Okay, so I know it seems weird, like why am I labeling something R? Why am I doing something S? But it was just the convention, kind of like just how you know how to name nomenclature in a certain way. It was just the convention to give specific chiral centers a specific um, configuration. Okay. So let's kind of, let me get a different page here. We're on page 41, if you guys are following along. Um, and we are going to do question 3A. Okay, so I'm gonna draw it over here, so 3A, okay? So 3A looks like this, okay? And we have this ethyl group on a wedge, okay? And we have this hydrogen on a dash, okay? So this is the indicated center, and they wanna know which substituent gets the highest priority number. Okay, so I do this a little bit differently than your professors teach it to you, okay? So like take everything I do with a grain of salt. But essentially what I'm gonna do is, first, I just look for complexity, okay? So basically you know that your substituents are going to be given priority based on the atomic number. So the higher that atomic number is, the more priority that substituent's gonna get. But for me, in this situation where I'm seeing all carbons, I'm just gonna look for complexity. So clearly, everything has carbons, except for this one, so hydrogen. So clearly, that hydrogen is gonna be four, okay? So hydrogen is a lower atomic number than all the carbons, so it's the lowest priority, number four. But in terms of complexity, oh, clearly this propyl group is definitely more complex than an ethyl group, which is more complex than a methyl group. So immediately, one, two, three, done. Okay, so what you wanna do is once you have your substituents labeled as one, two, three, and four, you wanna orient your fourth group away from you. So if you haven't watched my YouTube video, I have a really good visual of a, like a basically a, a steering wheel in a car. So essentially you wanna basically have, I guess, um, how do I explain this? Um, the steering wheel has a, I guess, a central rod that connects it to the, I guess, like metal frame of the car and that, group or that um, uh, I guess uh, big rod that's connecting it to the car is substituent number four essentially. So you can imagine like that hydrogen right here is the rod connecting the steering wheel to the central car and the substituents are going to be the actual steering wheel. Okay you guys kind of follow that? So now if I'm holding my steering wheel like in my hand and I want to trace the priority okay one is my right hand and two and three. So if I trace that it's one two three. Do I see if I'm turning my turning the wheel one, two, and three to the left, okay? So if I, I'm gonna draw this little orientation, so if I trace one, two, and three, it's to the left, steering wheel. So anything to the left is gonna get an S configuration, S, okay? S stands for sinister. Anybody that speaks Latin out there or some sort of like romantic language out there, S is sinister, so which means left, okay? All right. And then we're gonna do, keep going. Okay, so anybody have any questions on that one so far? Right. So for 3B, okay, so we have this chair, oh, not chair, <laughs> we have this cyclohexane structure. Okay. Now, this is where I am going to see who can really, really use their intellect here with organic. All right, so we're talking about this specific chiral center. Let's kind of figure out what our priorities of these substituents are going to be. So let me put these boxes here. Okay. So I'm filling these in. All right, let's do atomic number first. So clearly fluorine, fluorine versus carbon versus carbon versus hydrogen. Okay, so that gives me one and four. Okay, fluorine's the highest, 
hydrogen's the lowest. The other things are carbons, okay? Which side is more complex? This right side has an extra functional group. So yeah, it seems like it's more complex, done. Okay, it shouldn't take you, I don't do the C, H, H, C, like, you know, point of difference thing. I do it really quickly, like based on point of difference, complexity, things like that. Okay, so now, is that fourth group oriented away? Yes, it is. Okay, so let's trace that priority again with my steering wheel. So one to two to three. So one to two to three. So I'm turning the wheel. It looks like I'm turning it to the right. Okay, so something towards that. Okay, so that is going to be the R configuration. Okay, and um, R you can just think of as right. Okay, so there are some you know biochemists that use the D. Uh, the uh, letter for this is to, to, to signify um, dextro. Dextro is the, again, Latin term for right. So um, sometimes you, you're not going to see on your test, but in the real world, when you get to biochem, you might see L and D amino acids. So L would be left, D would be to the right. But for your purposes, for your class, just know S and R. So S sinister to the left, R to the right. All right, let's keep going. So let's do 3C, okay? So for 3C, we're going to have this structure. So now it's a net of projection. Okay. And let's put these boxes here. Okay. So let's do this. Let's do our priorities. So we see we have a fluorine, carbon, carbon, hydrogen. So easy, one and four. Clearly a carboxylic acid, which is the Q group, is way more important than a methyl group in terms of like all the atoms that are there. There's a lot more atoms and oxygens and things going on with carboxylic acid. Okay, so is my fourth group oriented away? Is it in that steering wheel orientation? No, this is actually like if I was, you know, in front of the car looking into the dashboard. If I was outside of the car, you know, looking into the dashboard, this is basically how I'm looking at it. It's the exact opposite perspective. Okay, it's fine. You don't have to like, you know, move your head like the crazy way that we were doing with the, um, with the other stuff, with the chair conformers. What you can do is still trace this priority, right? So if I'm going one to two to three, I am going to the right. So I'm thinking R, okay? But because this fourth group was oriented the other, or in the opposite way, I guess, in the opposite orientation, you just need to remember to flip it. So it's actually S, okay? And you can either memorize that or you can visualize it. So remember I said, imagine me being outside of the car and looking through the dashboard. This is how the configuration is. But now if I were to put myself in the driver's seat, okay, and look at it, you know, basically through the page, like, you know, through this way up into the camera, okay, and I replace that, one, two, three from that perspective is actually S, okay? You guys can see that. Let's say I put my face here and I'm looking directly through the, let me put arms. <laughs> if I'm looking, you know, from behind that, okay, I see that on my, left hand over here is going to be three and then over here is going to be one and up top there so if i'm tracing that i'm definitely going to go to the left okay from that perspective all right so either you can remember to invert it or you can like put your head on the other side and envision it. up to you all right three d okay three d so i said to you guys you will have to deal with chair conformers twice after this and then never again so you already dealt with the chair conformers in its first kind of you know approach and here's the second here's the second time you're going to do it the next time is going to be when we talk about um chapter nine okay so we're not in chapter nine yet so here we go one two three four okay so let's put in our you know priorities here so we see that we have a nitrogen carbon 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 okay so clearly one okay and then clearly this left side of the ring looks like it has a lot more carbons and methyl groups than the right side of the ring so that would make it two that would make it three and then this plain methyl group is the lowest obviously so that's four okay Do you just get what i'm saying by complexity like clearly this left side of the ring has carbons carbons and then another methyl group this one just has carbons carbons no methyl group this one has just a methyl group so you know you're basically just doing it based on kind of like craziness or complexity Okay, is my fourth group oriented away? Okay, so yeah, the fourth group is oriented away. So one, two, three. Okay, so that's gonna be the S configuration if I trace it like that. Oh, I thought this was gonna be um, that example. Did I skip that example? I wanna show you the chair. Um, let me see where that is. Give me one second, guys. This is definitely right. I'm just looking for a special example.
Okay, let's do this. Let's do it like this. I'm gonna make up a new question, all right? So let's just do bonus over here or something. This is important for you guys. So let's say I take that same structure kind of. Let me just add a fluorine here instead of that being CH3. Okay, and I were to ask you to do the same thing. Okay, so let's just like label the substituents obviously. So we have one, we have two, we have this three crazy side of the ring and we have four. Okay, so I think you guys are pretty good at that at this point. Okay, so then fourth group is actually in plane. Do you see it's this whole right side of the ring? How do I envision that? How do I basically like imagine that this structure is going to be, you know, with the fourth group oriented away? So what I want you to do because you're gonna hate me, is draw a Newman projection looking down this one, two carbon bond. Okay, so if I were to draw that dot for carbon one, I didn't mean to say chair. If I said chair earlier, I meant Newman projection. Okay, so basically what it is, is if I draw this front carbon, the second priority substituent is a wedge, okay? And that's the nitro group. So I'm thinking from this perspective, it's gonna be my right fist. Okay, so if I were to take my right fist from this perspective, and put it on here, it's gonna be that nitro group, NO2, okay? Then that makes that fluorine, if I'm looking at from that perspective on this side, my left fist. So my left fist being translated here is gonna be right there, okay? So let's just say one here, we'll say that's two here. And I don't know how to draw this. I don't know how to draw this, this, this whole left side of the ring, so I'm just gonna draw a line and say number three. Okay, because why not? That's what it is, substituent number three. And I don't even need to draw the back carbon because the back carbon I know is gonna be substituent number four. And that is the whole point of this. Remember that Newman projections are looking down this carbon-carbon axis and specifically in this specific Newman projection, that fourth group is the one that's behind it. So that is exactly what we need in terms of tracing the priority. So let's just trace this quick you know, Newman projection, one to two to three, one, two, three. Okay, and that's definitely the S configuration. Okay, so you know, you don't just have to do Newman projections when we ask you to do it on your test. Like everything you learn is a tool, you know, so let's use these Newman projections to help me visualize that. If you didn't want to use a Newman projection, or you didn't think to use a Newman projection, you can literally just kind of imagine your face, you know, in this orientation and then just visualize it. Where is one, two, and three in 3D space? You guys will get better with that. Um, so yeah, that is the configuration. Yeah, I just noticed that. <laughs> Thank you. I was just like, that was really bizarre because I wrote it one there and it, so it really should be R. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. I just put the wrong number on. Hopefully that didn't confuse you. All right, so that's R and S. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so number four, I'm gonna leave you guys to do at home because four is just a whole bunch of extra practice with this, except we're not making you do like all the one, two, three, four, like that's just things you have to do in your head to get the chiral center configuration. Okay, so practice with question four, that's a whole bunch of examples for you. Um, and let's move on to enantiomers and diastereomers. So when are we open like on time? Oh, we have enough time, cool. Okay, so we talked about a couple of isomers already. So let me kind of guide you guys where we are. Okay, so isomers. Isomers are everywhere. I told you guys, if you guys are pre-professional going into med school, dental school, vet school, anything like that, you guys are going, someone's microphone is on, guys. Okay. But um, basically what it is, is isomers are all over the place and they're definitely going to come back up. So, you know, it's a good idea to get that foundational concept now. Okay, so isomers. Isomers are basically these chemical, um, these chemicals that have differing structure but have the same molecular formula so same molecular formula we said that same molecular formula but differ somehow structurally but differ why do i keep using this pen but differ structurally structurally okay so same molecular formula but they're going to differ structurally okay so we talked about and this is definitely worth committing i guess to memory but it's not really memory because it makes sense so this, this first type that we talked about is the differing in basically um, substitution. Substitution is what's going to give us these constitutional isomers. And we talked about that. Okay, so that's the first class. And the constitutional isomers, I'll draw an example like this, is if I have, you know, um, butane, another one of those examples would have been, you know, something like that. Okay, so these would be the structural isomers, um, I'm sorry, the constitutional isomers of um, butane. 
okay? Just moving those substitution patterns. Okay, so then if it doesn't differ in substitution but differs in 3D space, okay, maybe it's 3D arrangement, we're gonna be called something like a stereo isomer. Okay, stereo meaning like stereo center, like 3D stereo chemistry, okay? And these stereo isomers can be classified in two different ways. Are they going to be differing via rotations? Or is it gonna be configuration? Okay, so via rotation, we know those are conformers, okay, conformational isomers. And those are what we already saw with Newman projections, conformational isomers. So maybe if I draw an example like, let's do this. This bromine example, okay, and I were to draw the Newman projection like this, so. And I would, let me just think about this for a second. Um, Okay, and I would draw this Newman projection, okay? These would be conformational isomers because in this, let's draw this Newman projection looking down that axis, we see that we have CH3, we have H's to the left and to the right. We see that we have on our back carbon, the bromine going down, that CH3 going up, and that hydrogen there. Okay, so if I were to look down that axis, this is that Newman projection. But it almost definitely does not relate to this Newman projection because you saw the back carbon looks like it was rotated 120 degrees, okay, to the left. So these would be conformational isomers. All you're doing is rotating around these bonds, because that's what a conformational isomer is, okay? I hope I'm kind of guiding you guys through all this. Okay, so now configurational isomers. So that's specifically RNS configuration. So that's by con configuration, you remember, we talked about absolute configuration. So these are the specific RNS deviances, okay? And that is what we're talking about today, okay? So there are two types of these. So let's just kind of break them down over here. So we have enantiomers, okay, and diastereomers, okay? And enantiomers are specific configurational stereoisomers where all of those chiral centers are going to invert. Okay, so I'm just gonna, we, know what, we don't necessarily know what that means yet, but all chiral centers invert, okay? Whereas diastereomers are gonna be partial inversion. Okay, partial inversion. Okay, so that is that. Now, so what we're gonna do with the subset of diastereomers is one weird thing, and I'm gonna draw it in purple because it's just weird, and maybe if you know that it's weird, you'll remember that it's weird. There's a subset of diastereomers called cis-trans isomerism. Cis-trans isomerism. And that specifically, that, okay? So notice how this is the trans version of butene, and this is the cis version of butene, okay? So the cis trans orientation, for some reason, gets the subset diastereomer. And honestly, if you really want it, you guys don't know it yet until chapter five. I don't know if you guys got to chapter five yet. But um, actually, let's just leave this as that now. I don't want to give you the real answer yet. Just know that cis trans is the subset of diastereomers. Which, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so Skylar, that's a great point too. Cis-trans isomerism equals geometric. Thank you. I can also write that word as well. Geometric isomers as well. Okay. Weird. We don't necessarily know why yet. You'll know in chapter five when we do alkene naming and stuff like that. But I'll definitely give you guys that explanation when we get there. Okay? So this is very important to know where you guys are in terms of identifying relationships. You don't have to memorize this tree. I think it makes a lot of sense in terms of like our progress in the class. Like we went from here, down here, down here, down here, down here. Okay, so it's kind of like naturally as we go, we build more and more branches. But um, yeah, like I did that from memory. So if you guys can do this from memory, maybe it's a good way to practice all the, um, all the like, concepts that we're learning for isomers. Anyway, so we're gonna talk about enantiomers and diastereomers today. So by what I mean by all chiral centers inverting, let's say if I were to go through my molecule and I saw that all the chiral centers were R. Let's say R, an R, maybe there was an S in here, maybe another R, and then the other structure that I was comparing, it went S, S, R, S, that's an enantiomer. And there's only one specific enantiomer for a molecule. But diastereomers, let's say I had that same R, R, S, R, and we went to S, R, S, R, Notice how these didn't change, these didn't change, these didn't change, but only one of them. So partial inversion is why we would have a diastereomer. okay? So let's go to page 43, if you guys are following along. 
So it says, draw the single enantiomer and all the diastereomers for molecules of it to below. So all molecules will have, I mean, all chiral molecules are going to have one enantiomer and multiple diastereomers. Okay, so there's only a single enantiomer, and that makes sense because that single enantiomer has to have all the chiral centers in birth. There's not another combination of that. But diastereomers, I could do any of these combinations of changes, and that's why I'm going to have so many. Okay, so there's one other thing I want you guys to know. This formula called 2 to the n, really, really helpful. Okay, so 2 to the n basically means that these are the total stereoisomers, the total number of stereoisomers, okay, where n is the number of chiral centers, okay? So let's say I had a structure maybe with, let's say something like this, and I had a bromine, and I had a fluorine, okay? So I see I have two chiral centers right there. So that means I'm going to do two to the two, which means that there should be four total stereoisomers. Okay, so let's say I wanted to draw that, you know, one enantiomer and maybe the three other diastereomers. So the one enantiomer is going to be where these chiral centers invert, okay? So something that you guys should know is that if I have a wedge, you know, substituent, I don't necessarily know if it's R or S yet, and I have a dash substituent, the way to invert that chiral center and to invert that configuration is to simply just change that wedge and dash orientation. Okay, because in doing so, you're literally plucking off, you know, this fluorine and you're exchanging it for the hydrogen, and that's going to move that priority four to priority one and one to four, and when you move those priorities around, it changes the whole configuration. Okay, and if you don't believe me, let's do our, you know, priority labeling here. So let's do, here we have one for bromine, this highest atomic number, then we have, you know, our fluorine to the right, so this whole right substituent is two, this methyl group is three, and the hydrogen is four. I'm just going to draw four. Okay, so let's trace that. So here, that bromine is definitely going to be the S, I mean, sorry, the R configuration. So we want to make sure that the bromine here is going to be the S configuration. That's the definition of an enantiomer. So it would be one, two, three. But remember, now this hydrogen is actually on a wedge. That's four. So yeah, let's trace it again. Remember, one, two, three, that's R. But one of those rules that you had to remember was is that if the hydrogen is not oriented away, you have to remember to flip. So yeah, we think it's R, which we'd say that, but remember to invert, so it's S, okay? So that was one chiral center already inverting just by changing the wedge to the dash. And you can pretty much guarantee that the same thing is gonna happen here, okay? So that would be the enantiomer. And the diastereomers are just gonna be all the other combinations. So it would be maybe something like this. So let's do both wedges. Okay, and then let's do maybe both dashes. Okay, so these are my four total structures. So one, two, three, four. Okay, and this was my single enantiomer that I'm gonna draw E, and then this is my diastereomers. Okay, why are they diastereomers? Well, okay, if I had you know R in my original structure and R in my original structure here, only thing that changed was the fluorine, so it's partially inverting. Same thing here, the fluorine was the same here, the fluorine was the same here, but the bromine changed, that's partial inversion, so diastereomers, okay? So always one enantiomer, and then any of the other combos are gonna be the diastereomers. Any questions on that? Okay, so let's just jump into problems. So I'm gonna go back to the workbook now, right over here, okay? So I did this example for somebody in office hours, you know, last week, but um, let's just do A first. Okay, so I see I have one chiral center. Okay, so let me do my little formula. Two to the n equals one, because, I'm sorry, n equals one, so two to the one equals two. Okay, so we should have two structures. So this is one of them, but there should be one more. Okay, so we draw the single enantiomer and any other diastereomers if applicable. Well, if there is only one chiral center, we can't have partial inversion because there's nothing else to compare it to. So basically, you're only gonna have the single enantiomer, and I can just basically remember to put that wedge as a dash, so that, whatever this configuration was, let's say it's actually, in this case it's R, it becomes S. And you can just verify that by doing your priority rules. So that's the single enantiomer. In this situation, if I wanted to draw the single enantiomer, all you had to do was just flip the sides. So notice how that dash became the wedge right here, and this wedge became the dash over here. So that's the single enantiomer, okay? And then these two are the diastereomers, and we kind of proved that already. Remember, there were two chiral centers, so two to the two equals four, Okay, so that's one, two, three, four structures. All right, 
Let's just see. So I see that I have two chiral centers. So I'm thinking two to the two equals four. I already have one of them. So the single enantiomer would be complete conversion of everything. So let's just make that wedge a dash. And then make this methyl also a dash. And that's a single enantiomer. Oh, yes, I just saw that chat. I just saw that chat question. Is B not a miso compound? Okay, so in B, you see, I drew these brackets. I forgot to mention that. I drew these brackets because both of these diastereomers are the same. Okay, and if they're the same, you don't necessarily have to draw them twice. And you actually don't really want to draw them twice. You'd rather draw one of them and say miso. Okay, so even though you predicted four, okay, you can just draw one of them and draw, you know, the three total structures because they technically replete. If I were to just pancake flip, you know, this thing over, you would see that these wedges become dashes. Okay, so these wedges that stick out, like my fingers sticking up at the paper, when I flip my pen, when I flip my hand over, they're now into the paper. So the wedge sticking up became the dash going in. Okay, so it's my single enantiomer, and then any order the diastereomers are going to be partial inversion. If you pancake the last one, it is not the same as the first. That is correct. That's why this is the enantiomer. I'm confused on your question. If you want to elaborate a little bit more. Okay. So partial inversion is going to be maybe let's keep that alpha group the same and make this methyl group a dash. And then also we can try the other combination. Maybe let's keep this one as a dash and then make this one a wedge still. And these are my two diastereomers. And that's four total structures. Really easy. Like, you don't even have to do RNS for everything. You can just remember these inversion things wedge, dash, dash, to wedge. Okay, so for this structure, we kind of weird. It's like two cyclic structures together. So the one enantiomer is going to be the one where these are both those. Okay, so this is going to be my enantiomer. And then the diastereomers are going to be where. This is a wedge. Maybe this is a dash. Okay. But again, now if I draw this one, okay, maybe this one's a wedge and this one's a dash. Okay. Maybe this is the diastereomer and this is a diastereomer. Okay. And that's it because I have two chiral centers. So I should have a total of four. Okay. That's that. All right. Let's do E. So I see that I have actually one, two, three three chiral centers, okay, but specifically, um, what we can do here is draw this. The one enantiomer to this would be, you can draw dashes meeting, meeting each other. So you can basically imagine, let me draw this kind of. I can't see it. Oh, you can't see? Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so you know, you can basically imagine kind of this planar depiction. I'm gonna do my best, um, something like that. And you really have this bridge. Okay, so this is like if I take this flat structure and I were to rotate it like that. Okay, if I take that flat structure and I rotate it like that, this is that kind of bridge that we don't really, that we're seeing here. That's why it's depicted as a wedge coming up. So if I did the same thing right here, it's basically saying that they're dashes or they're going underneath it. So instead of going up, we draw the same kind of thing. That depiction now is that bridge. Okay, so now it's below the plane. Okay, and then this substituent over here that's a dash ester is really going to be the wedge ester okay and any other you know combinations of partial inversion maybe let's say let me draw an answer mark here and any other partial inversions maybe let's say i do that and keep this one as a dash would be a diastereomer and then another potential one is going to be maybe um, let's do wedges here, wedges here, and a wedge here. Oops, then into partial Oops. wedges and wedges. No, that works. O O E T. Okay, and there technically are more. This is beyond our knowledge. We're going to do something with Orgo too. So, you know, if you got these, you're not going to get something this difficult on the test. It's just meant for you guys to keep practicing. Um, but there's something with this bridge that we'll see like maybe later in Orgo too. For the purposes of right now, if you got these main ones, then you guys would be good. Okay. You guys are pretty much going to get like these difficulties, is my guess, this level. All right. So, 
so, so, so, so, so, so important, I can't emphasize it enough, is this page, okay, 44. This is guaranteed on your test. Like at least a couple of these questions are gonna be this, where we are gonna give you any combination of things. So we can give you like maybe a Newman projection and a linear form, we can give you a chair conformer, we can give you any of the 3D representations that we've seen and ask what the relationships are between them. Okay, so it's really important that you guys can delineate these. So let's kind of practice with these, okay? So quickly, I see that I have two chiral centers based on the substitution, I mean, the wedges and the dashes going on. And it looks like the chlorines stay the same, but these terpedal groups don't stay the same. So that means partial inversion, and that followed the, you know, criteria for diastereomer. okay? So no thinking, pretty quick. B, okay, so B, it looks like I have two chiral centers right here, wedge, wedge, and dash, dash, and it looks like they invert. Okay, so I would think enantiomer, but it's not an enantiomer because what you can do is you always have to check for pancake flipping, okay? I know it sounds weird, but you always have to check to see if there's any sort of flipping or rotation that would make these two structures the same. So if I were to take this, you know, structure, which is these methyl groups oriented as dashes and flip them over, they now stick out of the page and they are the exact same thing, okay? So they are identical actually identical. So if I would flip this one over, they're the exact same structure. All right, let's look at this one. So everything right now looks the same, okay? Except we look like we have different inverting centers going on over here, okay? So it looks like an enantiomer, but let me double check. Okay, so let's say if I were to pancake this over, so if I were to pancake that over, the structure would look like this. And we have now... Um, a dashed hydroxyl, a wedged hydroxyl, okay? So all I did was literally go like this to that, okay? And is there any other rotations? Can I do one more rotation, potentially, that's gonna show this the same thing? Well, yeah, maybe if I make this now go up. So just, I'm oh, sorry, if I make this go upwards. So now the resultant structure would be, oops, I drew that on the wrong carbon. So be a, Okay, and this is honestly the hardest part, so I'm not gonna diminish that in any capacity, is knowing these flippings and stuff. So now you can see that this structure is the exact same as this structure, okay? Just from flipping. So if you're just flipping around the molecule in 3D space and they're the exact same, first, what I did was I flipped this, and the dead giveaway, honestly, was the symmetry, that you see that these, all these substitutions are the same, but they kind of look like they're different. It's a big hint for you guys to want to rotate. So what I did first was, just to remember, I pancaked flipped this molecule to the left. So pancaking it over to the left gave me this. Okay, so take a second to visualize that. Taking this molecule and flipping it over. Okay, so this wedge became that dash, and that dash became that wedge. Okay, so that's how I got there, from right to left. Then, now I want to do top down okay let's see if that's going to do anything so i take this molecule this wedge and i put it down it's that dash and i take that dash and it gets flipped up that's the wedge notice they are the exact same identical okay so knowing rns and seeing like inverting is like your quick and easy approach but sometimes there might be some flipping that would result in an identical structure okay important Okay, D. So D, same situation going on here. It looks like all the centers invert, but if I pancake flip it over, you can see that they would be the exact same thing. These would also be identical, okay? So let's look at this one, okay? So it looks like we have um, a flipping situation. Maybe if I flip this down, let's see what would happen. So if I were to draw this upside down, so this now goes up to a wedge that goes down here here. Um, oh, did I miss a carbon? Yep. And now that's going to be up here. It's going to look like that. Okay. So now I flip this down. So now it kind of matches this. And I see that, oh, look, this, these, all these centers invert. Okay. So that must be an enantiomer. Awesome. Okay. I hope that kind of was easy. So if I see that, maybe, and I could have chosen to flip this one up, and then I would have also noticed the same trend as well. Okay. So here, there is no symmetry because, you know, we see this like CH2OH, CH2OH. So we're not going to really deal with rotations. We can kind of look at this and see that, okay, um, wedge to dash, dash to wedge, wedge to dash. Oh, I rotate that up. And dash to wedge and dash to dash. Okay, so let's just look at this one. It looks like everything inverted except for that. So I can 
fairly call these diastereomers. Okay, so diastereomers, only one partial inversion. Okay, and then let's look at this structure. Okay, so sometimes when we get these natta projections, it's weird. And honestly, I don't really know how to like draw these structures to see if like they're the same thing. So all I'm gonna do for this type of question is assign R and S. So basically I say I have the bromine as a one, the hydroxide as a two, and this propyl group as a three, and this methyl group, I mean, I'm sorry, this hydrogen group as a four. Okay, and basically, oops, did I lose you guys? Oops, yeah. Okay, and essentially what happens is if I were to trace this, imagine like my head is under here and I'm looking up. And I'm looking upwards. I trace that one to two to three, one to two to three, that's definitely the S configuration, okay? S to two configuration. Okay, and if you can't see that, let me draw a Newman for you. One, two, three. Trace that, you get S, okay? So then for this guy, we have one, two, three, four. Okay, so let's trace that. One, two, three, so that's R. But if you look at it, that fourth group is in on the wrong orientation, so it's really S as well. So these would be identical, okay? Because there is only one chiral center and they didn't invert, so it's definitely not an enantiomer, so they must be the same, okay? And I think I am out of time for today, so take your time and practice these last remaining ones. And then on Wednesday, we're going to deal with Fisher projections, okay? So um, that's the last part of this exam material, just talking about Fisher projections. They're really not too bad. Um, so let's pick up with that on Wednesday, and then we're going to just do like all the critical thinking practice then. All right, and I will see you guys then.